Jungkor. Yes, sir. Uh, we should start now. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure once again to invite you all to the second session of our series of webinars. Before going into anything else or the formal welcome address, I'd like to thank the, some people whom we know and are associated with and are very truly honored to be with them, especially. I'd like to heartily welcome Dr. Devi Prashad Duari, who is the Director, Research and Academic, MP Birla Institute of Fundamental Research and MP Birla Planetarium, Kolkata. Welcome, sir. Dr. Biman Nath, who is the Professor, Raman Research Institute. It was wonderful having you on the other day. Are you welcome to you, sir? Dr. Paramita Roy, Deputy Director, Jagadish Bosch National Science Talent Research. Welcome, sir. Now, I'd like to take a, a, just a couple of minutes to use this platform to tell everyone about Sky Watchers a little bit. Many of us know about the Voyager twins, the spacecrafts which are far beyond the reaches of the solar system now. now these Voyagers were launched in 1977. Now, what has the Voyagers got to do with Sky Watchers Association? Literally nothing. Just as the one point similarity, that is, the Voyagers have completed 43 years of their extraordinary journey. I just want to add, Sky Watchers Association has done the same thing. The seed was sown in the early periods of 1978 and on the 11th of August 1978 at the Auditorium of Shaha, Auditorium of Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics at a meeting, Sky Watchers Association was formally created. It was the birth of Sky Watchers Association. That is... <laughs> Uh, Shoiko, sir, please unmute yourself. Okay. But from the beginning or now, or could you hear me earlier? Was I off for the whole period? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. 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 Now, Skywatch Association also has come along with over 43 years. Now, 11th of August is the birthday of Skywatch Association. As usual, the doors of Skywatch Association was always open to everyone and shall ever remain open to everyone. Now, formally, we come into today's lecture. Today's lecture is on the mysteries of Space time from Newton to Einstein to Hawking. And the lecturer today who will be enlightening us is Professor Shomitra Shengupto, who is the senior professor, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. A very hearty welcome to you, sir. Now, before we go into the formalities, I just want to tell everyone something. Please do not intercommunicate with each other during the session. Please do not intercommunicate with each other during the session. You can use the chat box to only post your questions, which will be answered in the question hour session. Do not communicate with each other. It creates a disturbance to the lecturer himself as well as the participants. Please take it that if we find any intercommunication going on, we will have no other option but 
to block that participant permanently from this session please do not inter communicate within yourselves during the session now regarding the question or session <coughs> you will be posting your questions in the chat box which will be addressed after the lecture in the question or session and please do not repeat your question because we will have to go through a lot of questions now the lastly sky watchers association has a social responsibility going by that i ask everyone of you to be safe in this hard times please wear a mask when going outside when outdoors wash your hands with soap for at least 30 seconds sanitize your hands as and when necessary and please do not treat covid positive patients as aliens they need our sympathy they need our support please be with them with this i welcome you all again to the second session of our webinar series and now i am handing over the program to mr dibangade who is the secretary of sky watchers association and he will take you to the rest of the program thank you uh am i audible yes yes okay uh thank you shoyko sir for a nice introduction to the second webinar organized by sky watchers association again it's a saturday evening uh normal times we would have gathered at the office of sky watchers association at dhakuria uh, but uh, due to the pandemic it is not possible for us uh, as of now uh, but closing one such avenue opens many and that alternative way actually led us to this webinar uh, when our public outreach programs got halted we started to use uh, various online platforms like uh, facebook youtube to do or continue our public outreach uh, and we are very grateful to the stalwarts like professor shingupto uh, who readily accepted our request to deliver a lecture in this webinar professor shingupto is the senior professor in school of physical sciences at indian association for the cultivation of science um, he is uh, eminent teacher a renowned personality he actually needs no formal introduction his name was enough uh, for all the participants uh, to gather here and lots of them are also watching the youtube live streaming um, so it is our honor and privilege to have him amongst us um, extra dimensional theories string theory supersymmetry supergravity cosmology are to name a few his current uh, topics of research and uh, today's title of the talk of professor shen gupto is uh, space time mysteries from newton to einstein to hawking uh, but before going into the main session uh, i would like to request again to all the participants that please mute themselves and turn off their cameras if you have any question during the lecture do not ask in between just post it in the chat box once and we will try to cover as many questions as we can uh, in the session uh, yes sir yes sir sir do you want to okay okay and when professor shengupta will present his screen you will see a tab in the list of people written presentation bearing the name of professor shengupta please click on uh, click on it and click pin to screen so that you can view the presentation clearly uh, without having any problem and if there is any technical okay. difficulty please uh, yes sir because sir balloon dibang ko kare okay at the end of the session uh, we shall provide a feedback form link uh, that uh, all the participants will fill up and 
we will also provide this link to the youtube live streaming uh, in the chat box of that uh, so that the participants can fill up the feedback form and on the basis of that form uh, we will issue the e certificates and if there is any technical difficulty or problem please wait for a few minutes and uh, post that problem in the chat box we will try to see to it and resolve it as soon as possible and without any further delay i would like to request professor shomitra shengupto it's my honor and privilege for all of us to uh, request him to take charge of the session and deliver his lecture sir if you please Is there any problem? Uh, Professor Shengupto, uh, can you hear us? Sir, can you hear us? Professor Sengup, so can you hear us, sir? Ah. Ah. Una Please bear with us. There appears to be a technical glitch somewhere. I'm sure we can get back in a couple of minutes. Please bear with us. Dipankar, can you hear me? Dipankar, can you hear me? Sir, Dipankar is offline at the moment. Dipankar? Offline as well? Uh, Dipankar is offline at the moment.
So it seems we are having a technical glitch somewhere. We are trying to sort it out. Please bear with us. Sir. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, Shomitra Sengupta is in the participant list, but he is muted. No, no, no. There's, it appears that he is having some technical problems on his side. We were trying to sort it out. Okay. Be patient and definitely we'll get through this. Yeah, actually, there is some technical difficulty. Uh, that is why I have uh, talked with uh, Professor Shengupto over the phone. There is a uh, few technical snags. Uh, so uh, we and he is uh, trying to working out the situation. Please be with us. Is Professor Shengupto facing a technical problem? Uh, uh, he is trying to. Uh, shift another uh, to, uh, shift another, another uh, connect uh, laptop okay. and we are also uh, trying to communicate with it okay 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 Fine. let's wait actually since we have to depend on technology we have to bear with the glitches of technology also there is no doubt about that
দেবঙ্কর দীপঙ্কর আর Okay, so let me upload the file. So can you see my screen? Hello? Hello? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we can see your screen. Uh, But can you, can you see the uh, first uh, page of the presentation? Uh, no, sir. Uh, not the presentation. Uh, I have switched on the presentation. If you, uh, yeah, if you uh, go back to your presentation, I think we will be able to see. Uh, okay, fine. So I'm going back to the now. Can you yes, see? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay.
one with the entering the full screen is it okay with everybody is it all right yes sir yes sir it is absolutely all right and the sound is okay uh, uh yes sir the sound is coming uh sir, the sound is a bit low sound is a bit low yeah, yeah okay sir now it's fine now it's fine okay so uh, so can i start yes sir absolutely okay so uh, uh, firstly i uh, i'm sorry for the delay because there are some technical problems that that kept all of you waiting but i am indeed thankful to sky water association for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to present to present in front of such a uh, distinguished audience uh, of our city and all across the country and i am uh, really delighted uh, to get this opportunity to present uh, this very uh, my own excitement and share this with all of you and uh, this is a serious very difficult time that we are all passing through and uh, let's uh, share our thoughts through this platform and i know that sky watch association they, they are doing wonderful job in propagating science promoting science and uh, bringing science to the society so as you can see the space time histories from newton einstein to hawking i entered into the main uh, area but before doing that let me tell you about my own institute this is indian association for the cultivation of science from where i have come and uh, here just to tell you that this is a department of science and technology institute approved by ministry of human resource development government of india to become the first d to be central university in the city from 2018 where there are both undergraduate postgraduate bsms dual program masters phd program direct phd program all kind of program going on under various schools physical science chemical science biological science material science interdisciplinary science and mathematical computational science so we are, i would be happy to have younger students to see my institute in coming days and in my institute in, in our department we i have my own gravity research group we have several around 12 to 15 faculty postdocs and students we are working in a group and we are working on various mathematical and observational aspects of astrophysics cosmology and lab course so this is roughly the introduction about my institute and i would now like to go to the main topic today so as you can see that our universe it is a widely diverse universe unfolding itself like an ever happening three dimensional cinema with new stories and surprises now if you look around you will, you will agree and you will understand that all the time so many things are happening in natural phenomenon and there are signs something like free cinema going on all around us and it is being projected in a three dimensional space so it is already a 3d movie that you are seeing all the time 24 hours seven and we all living and non living being are the actors in the cinema and space our space is a kind of three dimensional screen and time measures a change so this is our common sense idea about space that we are in a three dimensional space length breadth and height and time measures how everything is changing and the entire nature with all of us living and non living being displayed in this three dimensional screen now the question that comes what are the characters of space and time does the screen has any role in determining the story of the cinema now this is a very strange question because usually when you go to a cinema hall to see a movie you never ask that what the screen is doing you only know that screen is containing the cinema is nothing doing doing nothing so does the screen has any role in determining the story of the cinema is a tricky question and what are the character of the space and time now just to give you some idea about the screen you see that the majestic giant screen we have a majestic giant screen uh if you look in the sky you will see the billions and billions of stars planets and 
all embedded in a huge three-dimensional space and time flowing through taking us towards the future space and time today's story they are not visible we do not see space we do not see time but they are the main central character of today's story so this majestic giant screen and i always uh, would like to give you some of the estimates because this is important in science what are the estimates of this screen to understand the estimates see our earth has diameter 12000 km sun which is our closest star has diameter this kilometer which you can see is pretty large and then if you go to our next level that is our solar family then you can see that the roughly the farthest planet to sun the solar family size is approximately 10 to the power 9 kilometer that is nine zeros after one nine zeros after one kilometer which is a pretty large number so this is the size of our solar system and they constitute the 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 our solar family and then that is just a star in that and now our our galaxy, our galaxy is a collection of rough 10 to the power 11 that is 11 zeros after one number of stars where sun is just one such star which is an average star and the extension of these this cluster of such star in our galaxy called milky way is approximately 10 to the power 18 kilometer that is 18 zeros after one and the structure is that the collection of some stars then empty vacuum then another collection of stars which is another galaxy that way the universe is constituted and you can already see that here one such star out of this many sun which when we are just one point our planet and there are observed 10 to the power 11 such galaxies where average distance between two galaxies is 10 to the power 20 kilometer and you can see this and this is roughly our visible universe and our space, our space, you can really understand is nearly almost infinitely large and it is containing all these structures of stars and planets. And uh, as you can see, just to remind you one thing, when you are talking about these planets and stars, the subject we deals with is basically called astrophysics. And when we go to the entire universe as a whole, where each of the stars and planets are not important, it's a huge, dense, densely distributed uh, stars and uh, planets in the galaxies. The universe as a whole, its star is called cosmology. So that is essentially the difference between astrophysics and cosmology. Now, we have, we have put space and ground telescopes. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the round telescope, just to understand, just to measure, just to see the various things happening in this huge giant screen of our universe. Science is basically an effort to write the story of our universe. The search for unity in the description of nature full of diversities. Now, this is interesting that we say that science, all kinds of science, basically is looking for to generate unification among various diversity in nature. Why I am saying this? Suppose, suppose you look at in every day, suppose you see a car is flying on the street, a sun is rising from the east, leaves are falling, uh, some, you know, water is flowing so they are very different extremely different their movements their behavior everything now the question is there are millions and billions of such phenomena happening all around you 24 plus 7 in our three-dimensional cinema of nature does nature be actually so diversely or there are few fun underlying principle unifying principle to explain all that is do you need 
one particular principle for sun, another for leaf, another for car, and everything different, or there are some few underlying principles which can explain everything. And that is probably the unification that we are looking for. And if we could do that, they are called the laws of nature. Now, this is an ambitious thing, and for this reason, I now tell you about the, our, our great master, Isaac Newton. His main contribution was that he first showed the greatest unification that human being can ever conceive. What did he do? He, he proposed a law which all of us had been learning from our school days, maybe early 7, 8 maybe, that force is mass into acceleration. Now see the power of this law. This law tells you that whether this mass m is that falling leaf or it is a flying car or it is the rising sun or it is anything on in, in the universe, everything satisfies the same equation. So this is an incredible unification, whole material world unified by the simple law that force is equal to the mass that object whatever that may be, time six acceleration. Now you observe that this M is basically we all living and non-living beings. They are, they are, we, we are the actors and actress, but what is acceleration? M is the mass, we are the actor and actress of this natural phenomenon. Acceleration is velocity by time. All of you know that rate of change of velocity is acceleration. And velocity is distance traveled in space by time. So basically acceleration contains space and those coming from science background, you know acceleration is the second rate of change of x, y, z with respect to time. And it defines three dimensional space that is three directions x, y, z. And acceleration is a measure of second rate of the position. And clearly we see that space and time become part of our fundamental law and that is expected because this here is the screen, here is the time, here is the actress, and here the force which determines the story that how the actor actress will behave in this three-dimensional space and time. And this force therefore is called the director of the movie. So the space, the screen and time are inherent part of description of nature as I stated. And force, which is the director of the cinema, force is the cause of all changes. All of you know that if there is no force, nothing will happen. Everything will remain static forever. And that is the most interesting thing to talk. And therefore, whatever interesting thing happening around, it is because of the forces. And therefore, learning about forces is important. And interestingly, there are only two main forces which governs everything. One is called electromagnetic or electricity magnetic force, and the other is gravitation. Now, it is interesting that whatever you see around you, whatever you do around you, whatever force you apply, even you push something, pull something, do whatever, basically they are electric and magnetic force because the electric charges in your hand, in your skin, is coming in contact with the electric charge of the, of the, of the object which you are pushing, and they are you know, electric charges attract and repel each other. So, so electromagnetic force all around, but of course there is another kind of force called gravitation, that two masses attract, if the apple falls from the tree under to towards earth. It is not because of any electric or magnetic property, it is because of a different property called gravitation. So everything around you can explain by these two forces. So the important question is that, fine, so we know that force if we know the force, you know the mass, we know the space and time now, but what are the exact character of space and time? So that's the that's my focus of the story today. So to understand Newton, who first proposed this law, he thought that time measures changes and is unique for all. So time basically measures how quickly something is changing, how slowly something is changing. So time is a parameter with which we can make we can measure the rate of change. But he thought that there is a universal clock ticking always inevitably towards the future and all events are measured against this time. So that is something like a, a clock in the sky and 
rest of the universe looking at here that at at 8:30 here somebody doing something in india somebody doing something in uk somebody doing something in moon or somebody doing something in sun and the thing is that the entire universe is looking at this clock and this clock is ticking and moving towards future the universal clock that is the newtonian idea about time now according to newton about space he said just as we see a cinema on a flat two dimensional screen you know in an auditorium you do that on a two dimensional screen flat white screen our space is like a flat three dimensional screen length breadth and height three dimensional screen on which the cinema of our nature is displayed now obviously one question will come you understand what is two and three dimension a, a plane surface is two dimension our Length, breadth, height is three dimension. But what do you mean by flat? So what do you mean by flat? Now, by flat, I mean flat means the word flat qualifies the geometry. So what is the geometry? Flat means Euclidean-like geometry. Now, all of us in our when we were very early school days, we studied Euclidean geometry. Now, Euclidean geometry tells us that if you take two points on a surf or on 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 on, on any space. the shortest distance between them connecting is a straight line if you would go through any other bit from one point to another along path which is a curved line but straight line is the shortest distance straight line means the direction doesn't change it moves in one direction everywhere so the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and newton in his first law if you remember he mentioned that first law that all object moves in a straight line in uniform motion unless there is a force so he assumed that our geometry is euclidean now you can say that of course the shortest distance is straight line how how can be there can be anything else consider the surface of a ball if you i ask you to confine yourself on the surface of a ball you join two points it is not a straight line it is a curved line there is no straight line on the surface of a ball so it is not true that always the shortest distance is straight line but on a flat surface on a flat surface the shortest distance definitely is a straight line so newton thought that our three dimensional space is basically has this euclidean character of having the shortest distance to be a straight line now time and space according to newton therefore time is absolute universal unique for all events in nature and space is if something which is passive infinitely large three dimensional and flat with euclidean geometry so he proposed these two characterization of time and space and wrote his law that i showed you earlier now then with this newtonian this principle met with incredible success it explained everything starting from the motion of a cricket ball to motion of a car on the street to motion of anything on earth to motion of planet around the sun everything he explained with his newtonian laws it met with incredible success in describing various natural phenomena Till, till something happened a strange observation observation is that suppose there are two objects a and b and they are moving towards each other with velocities v1 and v2 with respect to an observer suppose there is an observer he measures that a travels a distance v1 in 1 second in unit time b travels v2 distance in 1 second so its speed is v1 its speed is v2 i asked the question what is the speed of b as measured by a now all of you will understand that from the point of view of a a travels a distance v1 in 1 second b travels a distance v2 in 1 second so the distance between them is getting reduced by v1 plus v2 in 1 second because the distance is becoming is getting reduced so a will perceive that b is coming towards him with velocity v1 plus v2 and that is exactly what happens when you you are sitting in a moving train another train comes from the opposite direction so this is what we call relative velocity that relative velocity of b as measured by a is v1 plus v2 and this is the prediction of newton's law now there is a big surprise surprise is that if b travels with speed of light suppose instead of this object then i throw a light signal so light all of you know travels with a very high speed speed of light c which is very large 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second light has very high speed but in one second 
travels this distance and one travels a travels v1 so a should see that the speed of light to be c plus v1 just as v1 plus v2 it should be v1 plus c but it turns out that a also says that the speed of light is c that is a the observer is saying light is moving in distance c in unit time this fellow is also saying that light is coming to him with the same speed c and this is absurd because you know that his distance getting reduced v1 plus c in, in one second so how is it possible that a is say measuring the same speed of b as measured by this static observer now this observation puzzled everybody so much that actually we needed a genius now i come into first deviation from this newtonian idea it needed a genius like albert einstein to question the newtonian understanding of time and space einstein said that see when you are saying that this observer saying this is traveling a distance v1 in one second and he is traveling c in one second and you are saying that in one second their distance is getting reduced by v1 plus c and you expect that this relative velocity should be c1 plus v you are assuming one interesting thing you are assuming that one second of this observer and one second of this man a are same how do you know that the interval of time are traveling elapsing identically and now people say that of course newton taught us that time flows equally identically uniquely for everybody so einstein challenged this question of newton and he said that no time cannot flow identically because of this observation time if they flow differently for these two observer then of course it is possible that unit of time changes the speed the measurement of speed depends on your unit of time so that will change so then it's just a back of the envelope calculation he showed that if you take so he said there is no universal clock as thought by newton position in space and flow of time are different for different observers so he said time flows differently from the static observer object a and object b and he found out by simple calculation that if t0 is the time interval measured by that static observer if you remember this person this person who was sitting here this static observer and t is the time duration of somebody who is moving with velocity v with respect to static observer then their time interval is related by like this so he is one second clearly his this is not one second because there is a factor here and you can see that this is one minus a quantity this quantity is therefore less than one and square root to the power half means square root of a less than one quantity is even smaller and therefore t0 divided by a quantity which is a small number is large number so t is much greater than t0 clearly therefore he is one second is much larger time he is he is going to he is one second is equivalent is much larger time therefore moving clock actually running slow so the clock which is running with velocity v with respect to this static clock is running slower than this and believe me it has been tested experimentally that actually it happens that moving clock runs slow but of course to understand it your v has to be pretty large otherwise c being such a large number this quantity will become so small that this will 1 minus a small quantity is almost equal to 1 and t will become t0 as you can thought so this effect will be perceptible when v is close to c and then you will see the fun so if you do this then you can you can explain that this this relative this relative velocity continues to be same speed of light remains constant now but this means that there is a limit of speed of everything why because suppose if some some observers are traveling with speed v velocity greater than speed of light then there is a trouble because this quantity is greater than 1 1 minus a quantity greater than 1 is a negative number and square root of a negative number is a imaginary number now a time can become slower but time cannot be imaginary that is just meaningless so then that's a problem so Einstein made a bold statement that nothing can move faster than light. V is 
has to be less than c so that this number is never negative so nothing can move faster than light but people then ask him that why because we all know that acceleration is forced by mass this law we is unchanged so they say that if you apply force any object acceleration means increase of speed so speed will increase will increase will increase and at some point cross the speed of light how can you stop it so the speed increases and finally it should exceed the speed of light and then how can you stop it that is nothing can move faster than light why because there is law says that there is no embargo on the speed einstein said there is one way to resolve it that yes that law is correct but still the it will the speed will not exceed c just to assume that mass is not constant what newton thought that mass is a constant quantity einstein said that assume that mass is changing like this so m0 is its mass when it is static and m is its mass when it is moving with velocity d when you accelerate the body its velocity increases and when it increases and reaches the speed of light it becomes 1 minus 1 which is zero anything by zero is infinitely large so mass becomes infinitely large when it reaches the speed of light and acceleration which is forced by mass anything divided by infinity is zero acceleration becomes zero therefore there will be no further increase in speed acceleration becomes zero so c is becomes a maximum possible speed so this is a brilliant way of expression expressing that how this entire thing can be put into a kind of mutually consistent description now people find really that yeah yes this is happening mass is changing so we learned that so earlier we thought that energy supplied by the force increases the velocity of the body but now we know that not only velocity of the body but also it increases the mass of the body so the mass actually comes from the energy that the force is giving to the body and actually you become fat when you move now this energy is converted into mass so of course the mass is convertible into energy by the reverse process and energy and mass are interconvertible so from those previous equation with little bit of algebra you can show that the famous relation between energy and mass e equal to mc squared where it tells you that from a small mass since c is very large speed of light is incredibly large you can generate huge energy and from huge energy divided by c square big number divided by this you can create small masses and when you know that we are creating new particles creating say higgs boson you all of you have heard about it we are converting energy into mass so you can convert mass into energy and you can convert energy into small masses so imagine the new concept of time the time that the, we we learned gave us new concept of mass and energy which resulted into a destructive thing like nuclear bomb where mass was converted into energy and two cities were destroyed it gave us the possibility of nuclear energy to solve our energy crisis and it also predicted creation and destruction of new particle or special theory of relativity so einstein you can see how he developed the new concept of time where the time became no longer unique universal but it is dependent on the observer depending on everybody you have your own time i have my own time and this new definition of time with every existence existential definition of time led to this entire result which are destructive constructive and everything but then einstein went further he brought into a revolutionary concept and this revolutionary concept i would like to draw your attention because it connects the two sides of newton's equation now this is something incredible that he wanted to get rid of the idea of force that the some body is exerting some forces on each other resulting into massive acceleration he tried to say that there is a geometry in the right hand side whether the geometry can generate force and i do not need the concept of force this is certainly a beautiful way to and not only beautiful is a very revolutionary way to think because as i said force is something crucial 
to have some important phenomena in nature otherwise nature will be static so let us go back to what newton thought about force so let's first handle the force of gravitation now force of gravitation all of you know apple is attracted towards earth and newton had the genius to say that okay the same force same force is responsible for the motion of the planet around the sun the sun is attracting the planets to every two masses attract each other and because of that force they move and newton wrote down those law that suppose you have a mass m here i have i've tried to because you know this entire subject is extremely mathematical i have tried to got rid of most of the complicated mathematics because that need lot of time but i'll try to give you the essential idea that the mass m and small m they are separated by distance r and the force between the two masses is given by this quantity where you can see the force depends on the product of the two masses and one inversely related with the square of the distance between them so as distance increases force falls very rapidly because the, the denominator mass increases force increases but, but fortunately or unfortunately this g is a very small number this number this is a constant called newton's constant it's a very small number and such a small number that unless one of the two masses is large this force is negligibly small and for this reason two bottles you keep water bottle you keep on your keep on your table they they normally they should come towards each other they should collide but you never see that them colliding it is because <coughs> this g is so small that this force is so small that they is they cannot overcome while moving on the surface of the table the frictional force on the surface and therefore they remain static but if one of the mass at least say earth is large then even this is an apple it will be attracted towards it and if both the masses are large one is a planet and the other is sun therefore of course with the large gravitational force so gravity is a weak force because it's risk bonus of newton's constant it's a very weak force and it can only be perceptible if at least one of the masses is large so einstein challenged this idea of newton despite the success of newton newton with this law explained planetary motion very successfully he explained the motion of planets so he wrote this law and in right hand side mass in acceleration he solved the equation and he found that the planets are moving in an elliptical orbit but instead of newtonian concept of attractive gravitational force as i was describing einstein came out with a brilliant idea the idea is the following Einstein said that from your school days you learned that you have a triangle and this triangle have several properties and the sum of the three angle of a triangle is 180 all of you have read i'm pretty sure the two parallel lines will never meet the shortest distance between two points is a straight line as i said earlier the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r these are all you studied in your class 4 5 6 i believe now this is called this is true only for flat space i i told you about that euclidean space earlier but this is true only for there suppose you take the surface of a ball on the surface of a ball if you draw a triangle the sum of the three angles is greater than 180 it is 180 for flat but if the surface is instead of being convex it's a concave surface then the sum of the three angles are less than 180 so newton thought that our space time is flat euclidean like as i said earlier a body travels along the shortest path that straight line in absence of force this is his first law and accelerates moves in a curved path means changing the direction of velocity so it accelerates when there is a force and and a curved path in space time so force results into curved path that is acceleration otherwise straight line flat surface straight line is shortest path otherwise because of force it will move take a curved path so newtonian picture no force moves in straight line or static or it moves in a straight line in presence of force it accelerates einstein said that it is accelerating because it is attracting this as i said newton said by law of gravitation is attracting no there is no attraction what the bigger mass is doing it is changing its geometry of space time to be from flat to a curved surface as a result this 
small object has no choice but to travel in a curved line. It has to travel in a curved line. And so he said, presence of mass or energy, which are equivalent as you start, I have explained, curves the space time. The shortest distance is now a curved line, giving the illusion of acceleration. Because now it is moving into curved line, not because it is there is force, it is because it has no choice. The space time itself is curved. And hence, the existence of gravitational force is an illusion. Illusion of force originates from curved geometry. So, now to tell you a little more about it, suppose all of you from your childhood have studied Pythagoras' theorem. It tells you that suppose if you have direction and b is the distance the square of the hypotenuse is the x square plus y square which is called Pythagoras theorem but once again remember this is true strictly for flat space in three dimension of course if there are another direction z this distance d this distance d will be x square plus y square plus z square where x is this it's called their coordinates. So it's from here to here, this distance here to where y and here to where z. So x square plus y square plus z square is the distance square from the origin of this. So it's a generalization of Pythagoras theorem in three dimension. Now, by this time, you now know that time is also, also become a coordinate because you have your own time just as your own position. You have your own time. I have my own time. Time is like a coordinate. So now we define a distance in four dimension and which normally should have been in two dimension x square plus y square and three dimension x square plus y square z square. It should have been plus t square, but instead it comes with a minus y. It's minus because there is one important difference between space and time because in space you can move in both positive and negative direction. You can move both upward z and downward z, this x and with the other direction. So you can travel in all directions, but for time, you are restricted to move only towards future. You can never travel past. And if time permits, I will at the end explain why this minus sign will guarantee that, that time, you can travel only in the direction of time. And also this minus sign will ensure by a little bit of mathematics, the speed of flight will remain constant. That's the original thing that we which started. So, so he defined this because of this two constraint, the four dimensional distance. So basically now, so suppose there are two points. Now I take instead of x, y, z, I take this distance to be small, small distance dx, dy, and dz. D means small. Just I mean, remember, instead of x, I write dx. D means small, dy, dz. So what I do, the distance I write, small distance dx squared, dy squared, dz squared in three dimension, as I said, is the distance square for two points separated by a small distance dx dy dz. So it is just nothing but the same expression with small x y z. Now you see that each of the coefficients are 1 into dx square, 1 into dy square, 1 into dz square. The moment the space becomes curved, moment space becomes curved, it becomes 1 plus some quantity of x y z say sub x cube y then y squared z, some function, these are called functions. So this from one, it will deviate to some addition of some functions, which will indic indicate. So they are the indicators that space is no longer flat, but they are curved. So the coefficients are never one, 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 like flat geometry, as I said, now they will change. So they are the signature of curve, curve curvature. These coefficients, they are called metric of the space and determine whether the space is flat or the space is curved. So in four dimension, you can immediately extend it. One plus f1 dx squared, one plus f2 dy squared, one plus f3 dz squared, minus one plus f4 dt squared, because you remember that it was one dx squared, one dy squared, one dz squared, and one dt squared with the minus was we defined for flat. And now we have deviated it from that. So this is the, so this f1, f2, f3, f4, if they are non-zero, Space is curved. If they are zero, the space is flat. So from this, I will not do much mathematics after this, but from this, <coughs> you just be with me. We are almost over. 
Now, from these four extra quantities, F1, F2, F3, F4, Riemann, famous mathematician, constructed two quantities. You do not have to understand all these details, but the quantity, they are called curvature, which measures how much curve is the space. The space can be slightly curved. The space can be viciously curved. So this quantity will depend on this, and they will be, of course, de de dependent on F1, F2, F3, F4, because if base F1, F2, F3, F4 are zero, then all these are one, 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 then the curvature will automatically, R will be equal to zero. So R is the measure of the curvature, and they will be zero if all of them are zero. So this is what we have learned from Riemann, and Einstein was exactly looking for so something. He wrote his famous equation. This actual equation is slightly more complicated, but essentially it captures the same idea <coughs> that this is the curvature and this is the mass and energy. If there is a mass and energy, space time is curved. Curvature is non zero. If mass and energy equal to zero, curvature is zero, space time is flat. This is just a proportionality constant which is related to that capital G Newton's constant. Now, R measures curvature, M measures mass energy. So mass, energy, curve the space-time from this equation. Particle now will travel in a curved line because space-time is curved. And we are imagining that there is a force, but there is no force. Absolutely there is no force. And this subject called general relativity, which completely baffled the whole world. Now the question is, so this is, I know, this is flat. And this is another cone in it, polar means some radial distance because when you are measuring the rotational motion of planet around sun you need a radial kind of distance with joining earth and sun so there's another coordinate but once again this is one minus one there are some quantities you forget about it see one and minus one makes it flat just as one and minus one makes it flat and if they they differ from one and minus one then it will become curved i told you the the sign of curvature so Take Einstein's equation, I guess I wrote, put the mass of the sun here and solve the equation. Solve the equation, Einstein's equation, and determine what are F1, F2, F3, F4. The solution that becomes this now you look, this distance squared is the no longer one and one, but they are slightly different from one by this quantity. And you can see if this is the mass of the sun, this is the mass of the sun. If the mass of the sun is zero, then this is once again space is flat, one, one. But since this is non-zero, they deviate from one, and therefore the space is curved. So mass of the sun has got curved space-time. Fine. So now what will you do? Take a planet and find its path in this curved space-time. To do that, so mass energy therefore makes space-time curved as if inducting life and dynamism to space and time. So as if the mass has curved the space, it is becoming more and more interactive and dynamic which leading to the effect, same as the Newtonian idea of gravitational force. So this is what Sun has done. And the, the planet has to travel here. So consider solar mass, solve Einstein's equation, as I say. Now curve, find the path for the planet. And due to the answer, answer is an ellipse. So this is, uh, it is so exciting that we get this correct answer by Einstein's theory of curvature of space-time to describe gravitation. There is no force. But people ask him, but of course, Newton force law of gravitation gave the same <coughs> elliptical path. So why do I believe you? So then Einstein said that, see, it is true that Newton's force of attraction solving Newton's law gave you elliptical path. That is correct. Einstein did it in a totally different way, calculating the curvature of these <coughs> because of sun, calculating the curvature and finding the path in the curvature once again ellipse. But I, Einstein said there is a difference. The difference is the Newton theory, the ellipse that is suppose this is the this is the planet which is moving. This ellipse, this ellipse which is moving around the sun. This ellipse which is moving around the sun, as you can see, it is mo moving in an ellipse, which is fixed ellipse. This is one year, then this is the second year, this is the third year, this is the fourth year, this is Newton theory. 
But according to Einstein, the first year is this, second year is this ellipse, third year is this ellipse, fourth year is this ellipse. So, as if this ellipse is changing its this orientation slowly, just tilting its orientation. And this motion is called perihelion precision. So, according to Einstein, the ellipse is not fixed, but it's rotating. According to Newton, the ellipse is fixed. So, from Einstein, the angle of rotation for the planet Mercury was calculated very small, 0 0.01 degree in 100 years. It needed very powerful measurement, measuring telescope to do this. And do you believe that it exactly matched with observation several years after Einstein predicted it? In this case, theoretical calculation came before. And the headline all over was nature obeys laws of Einstein. Now, this success and then some more success put Einsteinian idea of space time geometric description of force. So now see the passive space of Newton has suddenly become interactive generating forces. The space time has this hidden power of generating forces because of its curvature. Now then Einstein said, take the entire galaxy. I told you about the galaxy, which is a collection of many, many stars. And he said that I look at the universe as a whole. Universe consists of many, many galaxies and A is suppose distance between any two galaxies. Apply Einstein's equation to the universe. Now, the distance between, now A is the, A is the distance between any two galaxies. You apply that Einstein's equation R equal to Km that I wrote. You find this equation. This mass is the density and pressure in the universe. And A is the, this double priming, it is the second derivative of change with respect to time. So this means, if you just follow me, that A means how the distance changing with time, twice rate of change with respect to time. So basically this tells you that as long as the density and pressure of the universe, the matter which is there is on zero, the distance between two galaxies cannot be constant. So since they are, we know that they are non-zero, there are so many matter with so many gases and everything in the universe. Therefore, <coughs> the distance between the two galaxies must be changing. The universe is non-static. And actually Hubble found in 1929 that the universe is expanding. All the galaxies are going away from each other. And so if you now go back, you reverse the time that what happened earlier. So if you go back, then you can calculate that there was some time t equal to zero when that a that from the solving this equation, when the distance between the galaxies, all galaxies were zero, the whole universe started from a point because of a huge explosion called Big Bang. And since then it is keep on expanding because of the huge explosion. And if you estimate it, it turns out to be about 14 billion years ago very large but finite, not infinite. So finite time before the universe started from a point with a huge explosion. So this is that great moment and energy released at the Big Bang gave birth to all the masses, atoms, molecules and life because you know our life we are, we are, we are composed of atoms and molecules. They are all created because of that Big Bang energy of by conversion of Einstein's equation equal to C squared, the energy converted into masses. So, with no uncertain words, we are children of Big Bang. So, this is that moment that energy is gradually masses were generated from E equal to C squared, and then charges forming atoms, forming molecules, and gradually everything, the structure, and finally we are here. So this is the evolution of 14 billion years. One of the greatest success that if this theory was correct as, pred as predicted, there's a huge heat generated, a residual heat, even today should be there, even today now, should be there with three, roughly three degree Kelvin temperature. 
and Penzias and Wilson in 1965 detected radiation coming uniform through all directions, and that is expected because it happened in the time of Big Bangs, which has no preference. So all direction, they measured the temperature to be roughly three point, slightly less, three point three degree Kelvin, three degree Kelvin, and Big Bang theory was established by experiment. Both of them got Nobel Prize for this. One question may come: What happened before Big Bang? Some series do not know because that was the beginning of time. Other other questions from where the Big Bang energy came? The answer is you do not know. Who gave that initial energy? Today, the cause of entire existence. Now, since Big Bang, there was the birth of stars. Long after Big Bang. The clouds of gas collapsed due to curved geometry. As I said, long after Big Bang, the atoms, molecules form, the gases form. Now, these gases causes because of their mass and energy, they cause the curvature of geometry, and that curvature of geometry is such that they cause them to. It's a kind of, as you know, that is kind of collapsing. It's attractive kind of thing. So they collapse. The gas collapsed, and when they collapse, they started becoming more and more dense, and the temperature becoming higher and higher. And then a nuclear reaction starts. What is the nuclear reaction? Two hydrogen atoms of the gas they come close because of they are coming close to each other because of the curvature of space. They are space time. They are collapsing into each other. Imagine the gas is collapsing, becoming smaller and smaller. Two hydrogen fuses to form a helium, and mass of the two hydrogen turns out to be greater than mass of the helium. So where is that res residual mass has gone? The residual mass actually gets converted into Energy by this equation, and that energy is huge, as I said, because of c squared. It's a very large, and that creates heat, huge amount of heat, which stops the collapse because the gases were collapsing. This heat stops the collapse, and we say a star is born, and that's our sun is that star, and the heat and you know light that is emitting is because of the fusion reaction that you have I have stated, and. The huge heat energy produces our core pressure stops. But then what happened? After some time, all H will become helium because of the fusion. Then there is no new uh, the heat energy to stop. Nuclear reaction stops. The collapse will start again because of the masses. The space time is curved, so the gas again starts compressing it itself. Collapse stops again when another nuclear reaction starts because of the atoms are coming close, they are colliding, so helium to carbon to oxygen to heavier elements. Now it has been shown that it passes through various stages depending on the mass of the collapsing body. I I will cover quickly here. Someday I may talk about in, in more details. It passes through various phases called supernovae, white dwarf, neutron star. So these are various stages as star is evolving. Of these nuclear reactions and the uh, gravitational collapse, that is the curvature, because of the space-time curvature. Now, of course, how much curvature will happen depend on the mass. As Einstein taught you, more is the mass r equal to k m. More is the mass, more is the curvature. So, an Indian-born scientist, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, showed that if mass of the collapsing star is Greater than roughly the two of the twice the solar mass, then curvature is so high that nothing can stop the gravitational collapse of the star. Then the, the inevitable thing is that it will crash into each other because of the huge inward curvature. I'll show you, and the collapsing body becomes what is called a black hole. Now, so a black hole is a large mass star. And because of the huge curvature it has produced, it has coming, it is collapsing into itself, becoming denser and denser. And it is so dense, and curvature is so high. Let me tell you, when a star collapses to a very dense state, space-time around it becomes viciously curved, so that even light is swallowed in and cannot escape, and therefore it looks black or black hole. I'll show you a picture. See, here is a black hole. It is near it the curvature is so high that if there is a distance called horizon of the black hole if you are outside the horizon you can if you are lucky you can escape but if you are inside the horizon even light forget about anything else will crash into the 
centered towards the black hole. It has no option. It will go inside it. So why it has to happen? Happens. You remember that this was the equation that I wrote. If R comes less than two gm, what happens? This quantity is negative because if R is less than two gm, this one minus negative larger than one quantity is become negative. And I told you earlier that thing which comes with a negative sign, it can like time, it can travel only in one direction. And therefore, once something comes within two gm. The R can only decrease, it cannot both decrease and increase. So it can only decrease or only increase. So when it is only decreases, it is called black hole. Or if it is only increases, it is called white hole. So R equal to 2GM is a distance from the center of the star, center of the black hole, which is called the horizon, which is a very strange surface, which is a one-way membrane. It allows only one-way thing to move inside. It doesn't allow both directions. So once inside R equal to 2gm, anything even light can travel only in one direction. All paths converge to origin at R equal to 0. This is called the horizon radius of black hole. You can see this is a black hole. And here, anything coming within this, it will be swallowed in. Up, out, out. This is, you see, this is called accretion. Things are accreting towards it because of the huge curvature. It is pulling towards it. This is a huge pull. But they can escape if it once they are inside the horizon. <clears throat> then they are gone. Fate is finished. No information can ever come out. All information is sucked in inside the black hole. Evidence of existence of black holes at the center for galaxy puts Einstein theory on strong footing. We have discovered a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And gravitational force is a manifestation of geometry. I show you that in last year. This black hole has been photographed. It's the center of M87 galaxy, this black hole. It is billionaires away, with many billionaires actually light years away from us. It is a black hole from a distant galaxy, M87. And this has been photographed. And you can see it is black, where everything up to this point can escape. And therefore, it is lighted. But after that, everything is black. This is the real photograph of a real black hole. The question is, is Einstein theory final theory? Now I'm coming to the last part of the talk. Beyond Einstein. And then comes Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, all of you know, a person with huge disability, but one of the greatest intellectual mind. He asked the question, he said, black hole is not black. And he said that because of the effect, about which I have not speak much here, but I will try to explain his idea to you in a simple way without getting into mathematics. The mathematics part I can do, but for that I need a total day to show you the Hawking's calculation. But black hole is not black. I will just try to argue what was his argument it's because of the quantum effects. So what is Hawking's idea? Now listen to me carefully. Hawking said, See, what, a, what an incredible idea it is. Hawking said that all of you know, suppose you have an ice. And in ice, the molecules are closely packed. Ice is very cold. And they are very disciplined way ordered. You know, when it is it's very cold, it is ordered. In this solid object, very ordered set of molecules. If you hit, they randomly start moving. Liquid to gas, they start randomly moving and they become hot in more disordered state. And if I suppose this becomes this after getting, getting this becomes this, you have no way to understand that what was the originally what is so which molecule was where you have not lost that information completely. <laughs> you have no clue. This entire randomization has happened. So ordering to disordering happens. And we all know, since heat flow from high to low temperature, hot, hot to cold, therefore there is a tendency in nature that natural processes, it, a hot object tries to randomize the cold object by supplying heat and to make it more and more randomly moving. And randomly moving means losing the original ordered situation into a 
disordered situation. Losing that information of ordered discipline, the information of the, the in the indisciplined state, you have no idea what, it, what the original discipline was, what was the original order was. So this we all know from our usual idea of heat. Hawking had an incredible genius to bring in this idea which suddenly with space time with about which we are discussing so far. So Einstein changed the idea by bringing in curvature. Hawking got the idea of incredible idea of this uh, geometry, uh, this heat. So natural process came to transform ordered, well-defined information to disordered randomness, that is lack of information regarding the original order. It's natural process taking from order to disorder. This is replaced by a word called entropy. So entropy means the expression of randomness, expression of disorder. So nature naturally flows towards a direction when entropy increases. That is randomness increases. This is our understanding. Hawking said, see the horizon of the black hole is a one-way membrane. You have studied that it allows only things to come in and then it doesn't allow to come out. So information about various objects, suppose a, suppose a computer, a television, a cricket ball, a car, you, me, we are all going inside the horizon. So all informations, once it cross up to the horizon, you can see that these things are going in and suddenly it goes in total loss of information. So he said that this loss of information can be interpreted some kind of entropy, some kind of getting into randomness. So he said, this, this, the power of an intellectual mind that how he relates totally an idea in one domain into another domain. As objects go in, the mass of the black hole increases, of course, it's taking in masses. The horizon radius, I told you, 2 gm radius will increase because m increases. So horizon area will increase. Of course, area is, you know, it's a, it's a sphere, it is 4 by r squared, so area will increase. So Hawking proposed that horizon area is a measure of black hole entropy. So it, it creep on increasing as things go in. And that information of randomness, in the sense that loss of information is encoded by the fact that the area of the horizon is increasing. So therefore, when we are talking about entropy increasing, it brings in a thermal system. So he then showed by a calculation, which I promise that I can show you easily, but I need dedicated 40 minutes for this calculation. I will show you one day. He showed that this exhibits a thermal character with a characteristic temperature. So see, for the first time you are saying the temperature of the horizon. Now, what is horizon? That Horizon, things are crossing horizon, but horizon is the distance from the center of the black hole in an empty vacuum. So there is a curvature. So Einstein said the vacuum has a curvature. So that is itself a very complicated idea. Now Hawking said it not only it has a curvature, but it has a temperature. And he showed that the temperature to be this. So at this is a quantity called Planck's constant. It comes from the calculation because he introduced quantum mechanics to do it. This is another constant called Boltzmann constant. This is a pi and m is the mass of the black hole. So he showed that every black hole has a thermal character associated with it in the horizon and which temperature is called Hawking temperature given by this. And clearly as the mass of the black hole increases, it is in the denominator so the temperature decreases. So Hawking temperature decreases with mass of the black hole. And for twice solar mass, as Chandrasekhar taught us that you need at least twice solar mass Hawking temperature, if you to form a black hole, twice solar mass. So the Hawking temperature is nano Kelvin. Nano Kelvin is a very, very small number. I told you that the entire space is being out, flooded with this cosmic microwave radiation. I told you at the time of billion, which is three Kelvin. And nano Kelvin is much smaller. So how can I detect that? It is a smaller temperature, all the black holes. So people thought that this Hawking prediction of black hole having a temperature and therefore if something has a temperature it should radiate you know something having a temperature it emits heat but how can it emit heat because it's such a small temperature and it is it is immersed in a larger temperature of cosmic background radiation how can i see that 
I will come to this in the last part of the discussion. As the black hole swallows mass and energy, its temperature decreases, as I say. More it swallows, its horizon area increases, just as entropy, and I, I told you all this. So before going inside the black hole, the objects have definite information about characteristics of its ordered state. This is television, this is uh, you know, mobile phone, this is a pen, this is a ball, this is a car. But once going through the horizon, it has lost all characteristic. And if talking theory is correct because of the temperature, what will come out from a hot body, what comes out is a thermal radiation, totally disordered heat radiation. It has got no information about what has gone in. It's totally disordered. So this information is lost, and that is interpreted by Hawking as the entropy associated with empty space. So empty horizon in around the black hole has a strange interpretation of thermal description. So Hawking proposed a thermal character of space-time and thermal nature of empty vacuum. How to test Hawking proposal? So this is the final set of my uh, talk. Uh, and I will take questions after that. Uh, so this is interesting. Just listen to this, how we can do that. We have said that gravitational force originates on space-time and geometry. Einstein showed this, right? This is the first line. So if a passing question, can electromagnetic force, can this be also manifestation of space-time geometry? The answer is yes, if we have more dimensions. Now, all of us know that we have three space dimension and one time. By this time, you have learned that time is also like a dimension, of course. But now, if you have a more dimension, then in that dimension, if you add x, y, z, say another dimension, call them w, then that have that metric coefficient. You remember f1, f2, f3, f4, which is measuring curvature. That metric coefficient with that dimension shows exactly as an electric and magnetic field which was shown by these two gentlemen, Kaluza and Klein. And basically what they showed, take one more extra five-dimensional theory, five dimension, breaks into four-dimensional gravitational theory by Einstein, our three space and time, and electricity magnetism. So this is an incredible work where it showed that geometry space time can produce miracle by generating not only gravitation, but also electricity and magnetism from the entry. Now the question is, we find both gravitational and electromagnetic force from space and geometry if there is extra dimension. But if there is extra dimension, why can't we see them? We can see length, breadth, and height, three dimensions. But why is that extra dimension? To understand that why we cannot see them, you follow this diagram. Suppose this is my in one line, I have drawn x, y, and z, our universe, three space, just symbolically one line. And this is that extra dimension w. And suppose Big Bang happens, and after some time, for some mechanism, this extra dimension suddenly starts curling up. It is suddenly wind started winding up itself, and this end and this end become they join into each other. So what will happen? This plane will become a cylinder. Imagine that this line joining this will produce the lower part of the cylinder. So this will become a cylinder. So now one did our this is our x y z, which is extended from minus infinity to plus infinity, as we see x y our space. And this space is what is called a compact space. This curls up into itself. And now suppose as the universe expands after Big Bang, this radius of that extra dimension shrinks. It shrinks to a, this direction remains unchanged up to infinity, but this shrinks to a very small radius, very small radius, such a small radius. R is beyond the resolution of our most powerful microscope. We cannot measure this smallness. So imagine in our space, there are small loops, small circles, but we cannot see them because we don't have that powerful microscope. What will happen? We will conclude that we have three dimension only along this. We will forget we, because we cannot see them. 
but we cannot see them doesn't mean that it doesn't exist it does and if it does if it does if we can enter into extra dimension a funny thing will happen the thing is that our gravitational theory will change now this is interesting that do you know how it will change i told you that gravity was a very weak force because smallness of capital g newton's constant you remember that capital g i told very small value at that pretty small but what will happen because of the smallness suppose what will happen let me tell you only from newton's law itself that earlier it was gma by r square now because of the extra dimension it becomes 2 plus 1 or cube one more extra r here in the denominator so this is now new law of gravitation now this newton's constant which is in higher dimension five dimensional newton's constant but if you cannot enter into that extra dimension then you you are basically residing you, you do not enter here so you are residing at the surface that is at the point r you are residing at the surface you cannot enter here because you don't have that powerful microscope to here enter if you cannot then you have to replace one extra r by capital r because you cannot enter but then you get back your own constant in by r square because you cannot enter it's in, in your three, three dimension and where the law is gmm by r square that law i wrote earlier but then you have to identify that five dimensional newton's constant by capital r is equal to four dimensional newton's constant because you replace it by r this must generate your four dimensional newton's constant so g5 is g4 times r what i am trying to say that high dimensional coupling high dimensional capital g when you are in the extra dimension and when you cannot enter you replaced by capital r then you get back your own law then all newton's constant g5 by r has to be equal to g4 and therefore g5 is g4 r and even though g4 is small g5 can be large because of capital r and gravity becomes a strong force so if you can enter into extra dimension if you can enter into extra dimension then you can you can perceive that the newton's constant which is valid here g5 becomes extremely large and gravity becomes strong now once gravity become a strong force newton constant you do not need in chandrashekhar's calculation that large mass to form black holes so we do not need large mass to form a black hole even a tiny mass can form a black hole because capital g is large now the even a small mass produces huge curvature so such a tiny black hole has large hawking temperature because it's now you have a form a tiny mass because you do not need a large mass and you remember that hawking temperature was 1 by m we are putting solar mass here therefore temperature becoming nano kelvin now mass is very small now mass is very small because gravity is strong therefore we have a very large temperature because it is in the denominator small mass very large temperature and therefore we can see the burst of radiation coming up so can we detect this radiation by producing black hole do you know how do we try this this tiny black hole may be created once we enter the extra dimension and to do this we enter into what is called the large hadron collider in sarn let's see what we do we have generated a 27 km tunnel under the ground encompassing two countries switzerland and france where in the tunnel the huge proton beam are rotating and with a huge energy and their energy becoming so large you know that the more is the energy more you can your resolution of microscope increases more is the energy more you can get it you can with x ray you can go inside a body because x ray has a higher energy than ordinary light x ray can go in your body so this is much more than x ray and they can go inside that can they go inside that extra dimension by this hugely energy proton moving around the tunnel and we have kept our detector here so this is the 27 km circumference is the lhc large hadron collider you know his boson was discovered here two proton beams just to it's called greatest show on earth two proton beams moving in opposite direction with at energy is a huge energy do you know this is called tera electron volt is roughly energy of the universe few seconds after big bang 
So this energy we have created under the ground, and a proton makes 11,245 turns per second. Remember, 11,245 turn of 27 kilometer uh, circumference with a speed 99.9999 percent speed of light. The beam lasts for 10 hours, and then they, they are allowed to collide. And when they collide, now their energy, they produce many particles because of E equal to MC squared, but they come close and they, if possible, they can enter into the extra dimension. Because of huge high resolution and in large hadron collider to total beam with high energy may collide to form and since they have entered into extra dimension, Newton constant they encounter is very large and therefore even with them they form a tiny black hole. They form a two proton, not only two stars, but a two proton forms a black holes. Because Newton's law, Newton's constant is large, and they will have high Hawking temperature and will radiate. Our goal, we all de detectors are kept to detect whether we can detect this burst of radiation. If we our energy is sufficient in the LHC to get into extra dimension, we will see this and which will corroborate Hawking's normal description of this time. So, I conclude by saying that nature continues to challenge us by offering many unexpected things. One unexpected thing is recent time is that after Big Bang, the galaxies are going away, universe expanding. But because of the curvature, as I say, the expansion should slow down because of the universe curvature. They have, because of the huge explosion, they are going away, but it should gradually slow down. But we have discovered that instead of slowing down, it's accelerating as if there is a repulsive battery energy. The galaxies are being repelled. It is so unexpected that we introduce called unknown energy or dark energy. We do not know this. We are all in our group, we are working on this problem. Many all across the world, we are working. <laughs> the second problem that nature has given us that the galaxies, as I told you, they are, many of them are rotating galaxies. So galaxies are rotating. The speed of rotation is measured by the amount of mass in the galaxy. It turns out that they are rotating at a much higher speed than expected. So there are some unknown matter inside it, which is causing them making the faster rotation. They are not our known matters, and we call them dark matter, it is not known. What are their characteristics? And knowing their density, the surprising result is that this dark energy constitutes 73 percent of the total matter energy. Dark matter constitutes 23 percent, and we all living, non-living atoms, molecules, and matter only four percent. So try to understand only with four percent we have been able to say so many things, but. This is only 4%, 96% is unknown to us. It is there in our that huge giant screen about which story I was telling you. And maybe the extra dimension, in our group we work that extra dimension can offer this. Some other property of space-time geometry, once again, can they come as a rescue to this understanding of dark energy and dark matter? But space-time geometry you probably agree, controls the story of the cinema. From a passive Newtonian space-time, the curvature of Einstein's space-time curvature, the fabric, to thermal description of space-time by Hawking, where Einstein says there's nothing called force, Hawking said there is such a thermal character of space-time. The hidden mysteries of space-time tells us the beautiful story of the universe. We have our laboratory at Sky, and for which we spend space telescopes to explore. And we have large hadron collider on Earth. We are trying to understand, but we have been able to understand only four percent, or understand such to understand the deeper mysteries of space-time continuum. Because we believe that it's like an it's a gold mine. You dig it more and more. The apparent innocent looking space 
we thought that is very passive, just a screen which contains nature. No, it is not. It is a living thing. The space time has life in it. And it's some more deeper mysteries we will dig out in future. And this is that magical cinema on our giant screen continues. And when Newton said that we are collecting pebbles on the seashore, you understand that he was not trying to be impressed because actually we are. We, we hardly know anything because this huge universe, what do we know? But at the same time, we know a lot of things. We have been able to understand in the last 300 years of modern science, so many things. I told you a story, the story of the space-time part. Space-time part of science, I, I was telling you about the evolution of this. And I, today's talk was not that what we have been doing in our group is not a technical talk. So I told you that with these three masters, we are unveiling eternal space-time mysteries. They are, we are actually standing on the shoulder of giants. They taught us, and probably many more things are going to come under this. Many more mysteries will evolve, and we'll be able to come up with absolutely fascinating stories about space and time. OK, thank you. Hello everyone, it wouldn't be correct to thank Professor Shangupta, rather I personally feel that we should be thanking ourselves for taking the decision to attend this webinar. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you sir. I I can clearly say that for whatever reason, I ran away from mathematics in my school years. I used to fear mathematics. But your lectures, your lecture, and some lectures which I had the privilege of attending previously, now I'm regretting why did I run away from mathematics. I'm regretting it. But and some other lectures were a complete eye opener for me. I should not have run over mathematics. Now, for everyone, you have posted your questions in the chat box. We give Professor Shankupta some time because he's been talking to us for the last one hour. Okay, please go, go ahead. No, I have no problem in answering. Please. So, what we we'll do is no one will ask direct question. They have all posted their questions in the chat box. Okay. All of us, Dipankar is going through the questions. Okay. You sort them out and present it to you. Sure. Now, we keep in mind one thing, everyone, that it's about 6.50 now. We'll continue till 7 and address as many questions we can till 7 o'clock. The rest of the questions we have in the chat box, sir, with your yes. permission, yes. can we sort them out and later and mail them to you so that you can Please. answer back? I will, I will definitely do. You know, unfortunately, the initial technical uh, you know problem that in the process we lost about 10, 15 minutes. I mean, probably I regret that. Uh, if, uh, we would be more than happy to continue with you for another hour or so. And I'm no. sure no one will leave. <laughs> I'm sure of that. No, no. Okay. You just you just start asking the question and let, let, let me see how much I right. how long I can do. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Then, yes. Uh, yes then sir. I'm starting uh, with a question that uh, there is a question from Abid Sadhu that uh, so how is our universe expanding? Uh, is it because of presence of dark energy? No, our universe is expanding because of the Big Bang. But our universe expansion is accelerating. Try to understand something. Suppose you produce a huge explosion and things are expanding. But if all the components which are expanding, they attract each other, the curvature is such, then your expansion will slow down and it will end, it will come back again because of the attraction. But if there is some kind of repulsion, then the, your going away from each other will be more and more farther, higher and higher speed. 
so this accelerating phase of the universe is because of the dark energy but expansion is because of the big bang and uh, mr shadu has also added that is it uh, more than the speed of light the expansion of the universe see yes i understand no the, the whole point is that no, it, it, it is i if i understand that nothing can, no information can propagate that faster than speed of light this what we stated is a expression of making this, this statement means that relativity restricts that causally connected things suppose i take i give you one example this tells you that some event has a has happened because of a event b and this connection can travel one has caused the other the maximum possible speed is of light so two causally connected events that is which is carrying some information of one thing to another cannot travel faster than light so this is the meaning of the statement that nothing can go faster than speed of light so he, he should not worry too much if he hears something traveling faster than speed of light if it is not an causally connected information then anything can do with whatever so here the answer is no but the point is and the point is that what what i i, I try to emphasize that uh, he should not think that even something which is not an information cannot move faster than it should apply so he should be clear about it okay, thank you sir uh, the next question is from uh, chompa dash uh, she is asking that neutrinos move with a velocity which mm -hmm. is very near to the speed of light and according to researchers neutrinos have negligible mass right so according to the special theory of relativity oh. its mass should be increased considerably then right. why its mass is negligible No, no, no. This mass is negligible, which is raised mass. If you, if you ask that, remember, my expression was equal to m zero by root one minus v square by c square, right? Now m zero is the mass when is it at rest, okay? And m is the mass when it is moving with speed v. Now what he is saying is right. What you know, the raised mass of the neutrino is very small. when we talk you should remember that whenever we talk about mass of a particle as you have learned that mass is a variable quantity changes in velocity what do we mean by mass of an electron is this mass of a proton is this always we talk about rest mass that is when it is not moving we talk about static mass so neutrino rest mass is very small is it okay Does it answer your question, Dipankar? Dipankar, unmute yourself, Dipankar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Does it answer your question that the rest mass of neutron is small? Always we talk about rest mass. Okay. Okay. I think she got her answer, and we can move on to the next question. That how does antimatter interact with space-time fabric? The question is from Shubham Srimani. So, so space-time fabric, antimatter, basically, the particle and antiparticle. Suppose they start from the head. They are, have identical mass but opposite charge. Right. So, what is particle and what is antiparticle? Antiparticle has the same mass but opposite charge. Now, all of you have to know that. Mass when mass changes the curvature of the geometry, then it changes the geometry and it produces the appropriate curvature. But similarly, when there is a charge, when there is a charge, it has electric field around it, and electric field has an energy that also produces curvature. So, for negative charge, it produces an electric field; positive charge, an electric field. that has corresponding energy which produces curvature accordingly but the mass part of both of them produce identical curvature because the masses are same the mass is not negative masses are identical so the curvature produced by the mass of the particle and the antiparticle both are same okay i think uh, that answers the question and The next is uh, from Ananya Shutradhar. Uh, she is asking that as the 
ellipses are rotating mm. can the paths of the planets interrupt each other skill detail me again uh, at the path of the ha uh, can the paths of the planets interrupt each other no in, in principle anything can happen no? i mean it depends on how what is how the how the path is determined path is determined because the planets are moving in a curvature and uh, say even newtonian description there is a force whatever you in whatever way you say and there was some initial velocity at a certain point in a certain direction and that initial moment determine its path so here actually the path of the planets that we have they don't interact but that does not mean that you cannot create a situation where two uh, paths interact then the, the, if you create two planets in such a way they are their trajectory at the initial the initial condition so that that at, at some point of time they will collide then they will but in our case the in our planetary system lambda is no okay uh there is a uh, question from rita rita priyo pradhan is there a possibility that our space time actually follows some different geometry of which riemannian geometry is an approximation riemannian geometry has a space time geometry and yes i mean uh, there is a subject called not approximation I, i i think what he's trying to ask that whether einstein theory based on riemannian geometry that can be modified further with much more accuracy with some other geometry the answer is yes that is possible and uh, such efforts are there actually there is a geometry called einstein cartan geometry which is slightly different from the manian geometry and there are even other geometries also yes there are but so far einstein geometry has been with many success and if somebody can come up with some more different geometries which is not only producing the results of einstein theory but it is telling more then of course we will believe that that geometry is more accurate uh, to describe nature Yes, that is possible. Very much possible. Okay. Uh, a question is coming from the YouTube live streaming from Devarupa Shaha. Uh, why the effect of an extra dimension is felt only in black hole? No, it is not only felt in black hole. It is felt in other parts also. Uh, that part I have been covered. That if there is an extra dimension, then it can be shown that in our universe that will create apart many more new particles. many more new particles that part i have covered in this talk and those new particles are being searched in the hadron collider they are called kaluza line particles so there is there are some dedicated detectors we are trying to look for those set of new particles uh, so so of course black hole is one thing that we have correctly said but there are other domain where the extra dimension will make its presence felt okay uh there is a question from shomoshil that uh, said do really time machine exist or it is just a assumption theoretically do really time machine exist or it as you so far theoretically but actually time machine means when you can travel backward now the question is that it, it can be shown that if you can travel faster than speed of light we taking information traveling faster than speed of light you can travel backward in time so in a sense since we are restricted by that we cannot travel faster than speed of light so time machine is not possible but i tell you that there is a structure called wormhole in uh, i haven't covered here of course in wormhole you can kind of travel past towards past but once again wormhole is a theoretical construct the solution of einstein equation but it has not been uh, observed anywhere so so far yes it's a theoretical construct by which you can create a time machine but you have no real world situation where you have seen a time machine okay uh, there is a question from mohammad zahid dr khan if time is relative how can we measure the age of universe age of the universe no you have to okay fine so you have to measure with respect to some frame some observer okay so there are many observer we call co moving observer or static observer so we define an appropriate observer say an observer sitting on earth or observer running with the expansion of the universe so you have to define the age with respect to 
some observer say suppose we define a observer static on the surface of dot and with respect to that observer i can define a time but these observers times each of these observers are different okay uh there is a question from asm lsa i don't know the name what led einstein to assume that mass generates curvature of space time is it an hypothesis or based on some logical or mathematical background it's a it's a hypothesis because einstein didn't like the idea of two mass they are separated by a distance they are attracting each other concept of accelerated distance that they are separated but still they are attracting instead he thought that the geometry part in the newtonian description has been neglected by simply assuming euclidean thing now he always thought that force can be an expression of geometry till he was held deeply by his friend marcel grossman who kind of helped him to understand the details of riemannian geometry he was a mathematician actually and he held einstein and einstein had this hunch and you know all big discoveries are basically some uh, uh, some knowledge of intuition and then he proposes this it has elegance and when it finally gets success by experimental observation then it is accepted so einstein theory initially was not accepted till it it was verified observation uh there is a question from uh Trembug J. Charles, hello, sir. Uh, is the nutation of Earth possibly another possible reason for the perihelion precision? What 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 of Earth? Uh, nutation. No, this this has got nothing to do with Earth's own uh, uh, rotation or anything. This is only because consider just a planet that Earth. <laughs> But Earth is taken as a point-like particle, and a point-like particle <coughs> which is rotating in with respect to Sun, Earth is really very tiny, and Earth is taken something like a point. So there is no other motion of Earth, and it is just only orbiting against the Sun. So it is only perihelion motion is happening because fixed orbit is strictly one by r square of Newton. Einstein theory tells you not exactly one by r square, but slight correction over one by r square, and for this reason, the modification is coming. Uh, again, there is a question from our YouTube live streaming from Sravanti Chattopadhyay. Any theory in progress that can explain what existed before Big Bang? Uh, no, not really. Before Big Bang is a very tricky thing because Big Bang is the kind of beginning of time. so whatever you think you have to some kind of that will be some kind of hypothesis but you can i can tell you one thing there are certain models which tells that there was no big bang universe started from a not from a point but from a finite size it expands then contracts back so it is called oscillating universe so it contracts back becomes smaller again and bounces back again expanding then contracting so it's a kind of pulsating oscillating universe so it is happening forever eternally so eternally oscillating bounce universe is another model but before big bang is really not something very feasible actually still it is still it okay uh, there is a question from shuniti samanto that what is singularity the singularity is in when we do any calculation suppose and if you encounter infinity suppose you calculating some quantity so when this particle will reach at this point at at which point these two will collide what will be its energy what will be its etc suppose you find that answer is infinite then you try to handle it that infinity is something not measurable so in our daily natural phenomena there cannot be something which is appearing infinity So we say that since everything has to be have well defined, causally connected events, so infinity is something unwanted. So if you cannot, if infinity comes because of some mathematical problem, you can try to remove it by some trick. That's a different thing. But if the infinity is coming from some intrinsic failure of your theory, then it is called a singularity. For example, if there are two masses attracting each other, say Newton's law, J by R square. Gravitational force. 
if you take r equal to 0 if you take r equal to 0 then force becomes infinity that means on the two masses are no separation the force becomes infinity then you cannot calculate anything because how can you calculate anything with the infinity in hand that at the origin where the mass is sitting you cannot calculate anything there that's the point of singularity because nothing can be calculable so singularity means when everything diverges okay there is a question from arimpon modok how the mass of black holes are estimated mass of black holes are estimated okay huh. so see you know the how how do you see a black hole so black hole can be observed so far previously by what is process called accretion so because nothing is coming out of black hole right you cannot see a black hole that way so when objects traveling towards the huge attract the huge curvature inward curvature of black hole it is attracting towards black hole and they are spiraling or accretion due to spiraling which hasn't entered the horizon it emits because of friction some x-rays and that can escape to our eyes and from that i can measure the accretion rotational speed and that depends on the how the accreting body who is actually causing that is can be about the mass of the object so that is called from that we can measure the mass of the black hole nowadays we have another observation from black hole called gravitational wave which has been detected two years before and that gravitational wave can tell us the energy that the wave that two collision of two black holes has generated from that also it has been also created so it, 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 the whole mass has been uh, yeah uh, should i ask the next question or wait for some time no, yes sir take one more question and oh okay we we'll sort out the rest take one more question okay 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 uh, then there is a question from uh, Shagni Chatterjee. Uh, how? Uh, Tell me. Why does a body get stretched near the event horizon and not fall like a cannonball into it if the pull is so strong? No, no. It is because you know who is observing it. Try to understand that there is a kind of if you can, there is a kind of tidal effect near the horizon. Okay, for this, I probably I need a blackboard. That's the advantage of giving a talk with a blackboard behind. So that is a tidal horizon which causes this stretching. So uh, I would suggest that if you if you take something and bring it and try to calculate the net force that it is experiencing because of curvature again, we, we, we should not use the word force that way. So you calculate the curvature effect. And you will see that there is a tidal effect which is causing the stretching. So probably uh, you send me this question. I will try to write down the answer in a mathematical equation. Otherwise, I cannot uh, uh, say that like this. I mean, you know, you, you need to do the expression of the tidal effect. Okay, sir. Uh, we should. And there are also so many questions in YouTube live streaming also. So we have to send you all the questions. There are a lot of them. <laughs> okay, send, send that. I mean. If you want to ask a couple, it's fine with me. Otherwise, if you want to send, I you send. It's up to you because you know you are also there for a long time. I understand you are interred in that four thirty, I believe. So, uh, it, is, it is up to you that whether you want to continue or not. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. Uh, just uh, let me quickly go through the questions. If I get some interesting, I can ask you. Okay, there is a question from uh, YouTube Live uh, from Anandamoy Mukhopadhyay. Is the fabric of space time continuous or is it discrete like matter? It is continuous according to Einstein's theory that we have been discussing. But there are some models which say that the space time can also be discretized. So that's a different theory. That's not Einstein's or Hawking's theory. But that's another space time description. Uh, but do you know that why these people? I mean, uh, why why Einstein is Einstein because his theory has been experimentally tested. So this is very important that you observationally or otherwise you create such an impact. So this discretization is a good mathematical model. People have worked with it and they have done some important calculations. 
in particularly you know there is a crisis between quantum mechanics and gravity today i didn't have the time to discuss about the problem of einstein gravity with quantum mechanics now if the quantum mechanics of the theory if you uh, try to consider then discretization of space time can help you to handle quantum mechanics along with gravitational theory so that is one approach there is another approach called string theory that's another very powerful approach but that is one say in continuum theory so there are uh, you know the, the discrete approach is there but this is not einstein theory See? so I, it's, uh, my answer to his question is that einsteinian description of fabric of space time is continuous it's not discrete bonkor unmute yourself okay uh, let us take one more question and uh, rest of them we will send you to sir uh, okay. because there are continuous uh, questions <laughs> from youtube and uh, this chat also oh, uh, the question is from shayari bhattacharjo that uh, if there is repulsive force between galaxies then why milky way and andromeda will collide in future no see you have to try to understand one thing that when we talk about this, this i started with that the astrophysics and uh, cosmological scale sometimes it may happen that locally something is coming close to each other but cosmological scale there is a overall stretching so imagine the situation just i, I want to give her this expansion take up rubber sheet and put some ant on the rubber sheet now it is possible that the rubber sheet is stretching every point is going away from each other you stretch the rubber sheet every point is going away from each other but on that rubber sheet two ants are coming close to each other that is possible locally it, it, there can be some motion towards each other but the cosmological overall universe that's the overall stretching okay so uh with that we are concluding our uh, question and session and the rest of the question will be sent to professor shengupto uh, before uh, uh, switching it over to shoikot sir uh, i just want to mention to all the participants that do fill up the uh, google document form that we have uh, put in the chat box the feedback form that is uh, uh, because it will help to uh, help you to get a certificate so please fill up that form before uh, leaving the platform uh, now shoikot sir please if you do the excuse me sir can i can i ask you a question sir oh, please post your question in the chat box we will address it accordingly no sir this is no, not on the uh, not on the phys physics related topic this is the topic that can i get the presentation what the sir showed us please do i want the presentation we will deal with it i can please send contact, the five please contact sky watch association we will deal with it okay okay thank you okay i can send the file with you okay okay so now we have come to the end of this this session we've been talking about i spent for such a long a time i'd like to conclude with one of his quotes if you can't explain it to a 6 year old you don't understand it yourself this thing sir professor gupta to you yes you explained it so easily a layman a non mathematical person like me was drawn into it a heartfelt thanks to you truly thank you to all the participants who have attended this meeting before calling it a day thank you I refer to one line from dr tenter lecture which will prove that i did not run mathematics that is why he talking of gravitation collapse he mentioned that i have the time today I'll tell you some other day and he mentioned it several times in his lecture that he was interested in telling something telling us something some other day also so sir can we expect you to be back with us soon with some new topic
Sure, you just you just uh, contact me again after some. I'm sure I I'll come because I enjoyed the entire duration. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Was wonderful messages for me. Thank you. Thank you. So with this, this can come to end. Thank you, everyone, and see you all such webinars in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Vankar, uh, yes, sir. Okay. The question below. I have copied all the questions. Uh -huh. I will give you right now. Mm -hmm. You go to them, sort them out, and then decide which one. Professor Shankar. Right. I am sending it to. I am mailing it to you. Right. Okay. 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 I have copied. Okay. So uh, at the end of this thing, uh, I again request the participants left here, uh, please fill the form and then